Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Links Together faculty staff information session. Uh, my name is Ryan Huff, and I'm the communications director here at CU Denver. And we have a great uh, panel of speakers assembled today to uh, talk about the current state of COVID, uh, our campus policies, and to answer all of your questions. I'll remind you that um, you can ask your questions in the Q&A function <clears throat> at the bottom of the Zoom, uh, the Zoom screen here. And uh, first up, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Puckett. He's the Managing Associate University Council and uh, Pamela Yansma, the Dean of CLAS. They both chair the Links Together Task Force and I'd like to ask them to say a few words about uh, COVID right now, the state uh, in the Denver metro area, and talk a little bit about testing and vaccines. So I'll turn it over to you both. I'll, I'll go ahead and start, Pam. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And I want to thank you, start off with thanking you for all the incredible work that you continue to do. Um, I, it's just amazing every day. I, it's good to see people, frankly. Uh, it's good to be in person at times. Uh, it's also good to work from home at times. But I want to thank you all for the incredible work you're doing for our students and to serve our communities um, in different ways, whether you're serving staff, faculty, uh, or our students. Um, I, I always find it to be a, a privilege to, to provide that thank you because um, as you know, I, most of my day work is not engaged with students. So I really do thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, and I know it's not easy. And I know it's not hard. So let me start with that. Uh, when I was thinking about what, what I would say today, um, you know, I, I have to admit, I do wake up uh, these days a little bit more anxious than perhaps I want to be. Um, I, I wake up a little bit more concerned about what I'm going to learn about what the world is bringing um, than I care to. Uh, but uh, I don't necessarily feel that way about the way we're operating here at the university. Um, I, there are concerns that I do have about where uh, COVID and Delta variant is headed. Um, I am particularly concerned as I know many of you are, many of us are with kids um, in K-12 and we continue to, and I continue to watch very closely in the K-12 space as to what's happening. I know I read a number of the headlines yesterday as well. I also looked at all the outbreaks um, that were happening across the state uh, on the list yesterday. Um, lost my video, now I'm back. And you know, the good and bad news is uh, there are outbreaks in Colorado in K-12. If you look at the list though, there are very few in the metro area where we have mask wearing in classrooms, um, which frankly, I'm not a public health expert, but I think that actually is telling. Um, so I, I think what we continue to do is monitor that very closely. Um, we're aware and that if things go fully remote in K-12, that's gonna to have to impact how we operate. Um, does that mean we go fully remote? Uh, not automatically, not per se. What I would tell you is uh, we continue to uh, have a handful of cases, uh, four to five a week. Um, somebody asked this week if we could give a daily update or change the website every day. Um, what I would tell you is it's possible but we really don't have a whole lot of cases right now. Um, last year, when we did get a lot of cases, we gave two updates, Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and if we need to uh, do that, we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward that way. What you can see on there is that uh, we do have the number of tests we're doing as well as our vaccination rates, which right now are really great. Um, we're uh, north of 95% for staff and faculty and 93% for students, which I think is just tremendous. Um, I don't know that we'll go up a whole lot on the student side, um, uh, meaning there's, we've gotten pretty much a lot of the data we need to from students. Um, staff and faculty, we still could go up because I'm still looking for some forms to be completed. So all that to be said, I mean, we haven't seen spread in classrooms. We haven't had a single situation, and I checked again yesterday, either at Anschutz or here, where somebody has uh, gotten COVID spread through uh, a classroom when people are wearing masks. Frankly, I haven't seen it spread when people aren't wearing masks in the classrooms either. But uh, where people are wearing masks, uh, we haven't seen spread. Where we have seen situations, uh, sometimes roommates, people riding in cars together, uh, people working together in break rooms and not wearing masks uh, for long periods of time. So what I would tell you is that those are all uh, places that I think we need to be vigilant in mask wearing and, and continue to address. Um, but I get it, and I, I'm in very much the same boat about where are we headed, what's going to happen. Um, but I do think we know a couple things, and I'll start off with what I always like to say is get your vaccine, um, get your damn vaccine, wear your damn mask, because those two things work. And I can, 
I, I actually think that's just, we're going to be an interesting study in how that's worked in our community, um, because I think we have seen really great uptake uh, for the vaccine for our students and our staff and faculty. And we're going to continue to, to push that because um, as I, I'm starting to, to put the spiel in my head, because there's still family members in my extended family who haven't been vaccinated, I'm not asking them to do it for themselves. I'm asking them to do it for my 10 year old who can't get vaccinated because he can't make that knowing decision. He's not allowed to yet. Um, and so I'm gonna ask them to do it for them uh, because frankly, there are gonna be many of us still who perhaps for one reason or another still can't get the vaccine for a while. So that's one piece. The other one is gonna be mask wearing. And I know that uh, we have had a handful of situations, uh, just a handful of people not wearing, wanting to wear masks, <clears throat> but to be very frank, I have to thank you and, and applaud the incredible work that you're all doing to remind one another, to care for one another and wearing masks because we aren't seeing huge problems. Occasionally, yeah, there are situations, but we're not seeing that. And I've, what I've seen is I've seen faculty um, have hard conversations at times with students uh, and other folks about wearing masks, but I think it's been appreciated. Um, I, we haven't had uh, situations and thankfully, I was talking to another coworker yesterday and. Her family member lives um, in Mississippi. And I said, is there any way that person can move to Colorado? Because I actually think it's not the best here. I get it, but I think we're trying to do a lot of good things. And I think uh, we're pulling together. So all that to be said, that's kind of where we are from a COVID standpoint on campus. Um, we are seeing an increase in testing, which I'm gonna continue to encourage folks to do as well. Um, our on-campus site, Fifth Street Garage is open. Uh, I've taken to doing it getting tested regularly there. It takes all of three minutes once you know where to park and get in and get out. Um, we also have seven other locations in town where you can get tested and look on the website for that link because uh, I think that's another great resource that we have for you and your families that you can use. So thank you very much. And I turn it over to, to Pam. Hi everyone. I just wanna echo Chris and thanking everyone for everything that they're doing. As you look around the country, I think we're doing really well and things are going smoothly. I don't know how many of you saw the article in the New York Times uh, yesterday or the day before about faculty teaching at universities where masks from vaccines are not required. And that is certainly not the case uh, for us. I am learning as perhaps many of you are that managing an office both at home and then at work can be a little bit confusing and that sometimes I don't have what I need because it's in the other place, but hopefully we'll all get adjusted. And students are excited to be on campus too. And I'm excited to be on campus and to see people that I haven't seen in a long time and to have some semblance of what life was like before. Although I agree with Chris that waking up in the morning is a little more anxiety uh, provoking than it was in the past. So I just wanna remind everybody about the classrooms. Everyone needs to be masked in the classroom unless you can have 10 feet of distancing, in which case you can go without masks as long as everyone is comfortable with that. Faculty can remove their masks in the classroom if they're at least 10 feet away from the students. And then I just wanna repeat what Chris has said, we aren't seeing the spread in the classrooms uh, or in the residence halls, my understanding too. So. Thank you everyone for what you're doing and continue to do it and hang in there. And hopefully we're gonna have a great semester. Great, well, thanks to you both uh, for those comments. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Greg Gibson and uh, he is the uh, Senior Director of Building Maintenance and Operations. And Greg, I was hoping you could speak to uh, cleaning protocols as well as uh, HVAC filters and such. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and I appreciate everybody in attendance. Being somewhat new to the CU Denver community, it is exciting for me to see the full and vibrant campus that we have. And, you know, and for you to be comfortable and effective in your jobs, I feel that it's important for staff and faculty to also have confidence in their building systems. So I'm going to tell you a whole lot about what we're doing to help keep you safe, confident, and happy in those regards. So you should know that our facilities management team generally follows the guidelines from the CDC, from the EPA and ASHRAE recommendations for how we manage our mechanical slash HVAC systems. Our facilities management team calculates the current amount of outside air mixture to make the appropriate adjustments per the guidelines from ASHRAE. That's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, which is like a, a professional standard for the HVAC industry. 
the EPA, and TDC. So we perform routine maintenance inspections. We perform audits of the building equipment to verify that the air, air handling units and the outside air control dampers are functioning and controlling correctly per the guidelines from these agencies. Our facilities team has increased the amount of ventilation in the building to beyond the ASHRAE standard 62.1-2019 up to the maximum level that the system can handle. This means that we've opened all outside air dampers to all air handling units in each building to uh, their max position. And we perform our regular maintenance checks and uh, we have our building automation system software that tells us whenever we have a problem. Uh, one of the things that we have also done is we've increased the filters uh, that we use to within our air handling units. There's a rating agent, a rating uh, called a MERV. It's a minimum efficiency reporting value of a filter. So we had MERV 8 when we began. All of our filters now are, are at least a MERV 13. Uh, and we have a few buildings that have MERV 14 ratings. Just so you know, as a comparison, a MERV rating of 13 to 16 is considered hospital level air quality. So we are doing the best that we can in ensuring that we have the highest level of filtration that we have within our air handling units. Some of the additional steps that we've taken uh, from our facilities management team is that we've done a check of each individual air handling unit on a uh, per semester basis. We started last fall, we did it at the end of fall to begin the spring semester, and we did it earlier this summer for all of our, uh, all of our CU Denver owned facilities to ensure that the buildings are performing to the optimum capability of the equipment. So that's uh, the, the easiest version to tell you that we are checking all the time, we're working all the time, we have a dedicated professional and caring facility staff that are focused on making sure that our mechanical systems are working to their optimum capability. From a custodial standpoint, uh, we have a link that uh, we'll post in the chat that gives you the overview of what we take care of from a custodial standpoint. But for some common talking points, uh, we, for common area spaces, we will do a general, not we, but we have a contracted vendor that will do a general wipe down, spill up, spill cleanup and vacuuming. Common area is generally considered an entrance and exit, restrooms, circulation areas uh, such, uh, such as elevators, stairwells and corridors, common areas such as lounges and seating. And uh, we'll do those multiple times a day. We also do fogging of common areas on a weekly basis. We also uh, do a general wipe down, spill cleanup and vacuuming of high touch point areas. These would be areas such as push, push plates and door handles, push buttons on wall surfaces and some other hard surface uh, furnishings. Within the classrooms and computer labs and some of the instructional labs, the cleaning responsibility is that of the individual users and occupants. From a facility standpoint, we are interested in providing you with those materials that you need to do that. So if you are missing supplies or needing supplies, just please contact our caring and friendly facilities staff. We have a uh, website, we'll have a web address that we'll put in there for an email, DC Facilities Dispatch at ucdenver.edu, and we can reach out to you, and you can reach out to us. We will make sure that you get the supplies that you need. Also, we will perform fogging of classrooms on a daily basis. For personal offices, if the room need, if the office area needs a supply, please reach out again to the email address DC Facilities Dispatch at ucdenver.edu, and we will come by and drop off the supplies that are needed. We will take care of the common areas in an office space, such as the reception area, co conference rooms, copy mail rooms, kitchenettes and offices. Uh, for personal offices, we had a lot of uh, experience with the personal offices when people were returning back to work where they needed some kind of uh, uh, disinfection. So we went through and we touched every single office space within the Denver facilities between early June through the early part of July. We touched all the office spaces. If you still would like us to come by and take a look and do a deep clean of your office, just uh, drop us an email through the same email address and we will come by and take care of that for you. Uh, from a parking standpoint, I'm going to uh, have posted in the chat uh, a lot of detail about staff and faculty parking uh, at, for the CU Denver area. The big thing that you probably would be interested in knowing that we have uh, uh, parking didn't start getting charged until the end of, uh, <laughs> to the end of August. And we have a part-time parking opportunity available at a reduced rate for those that are doing hybrid workshops. You should know that the inter-campus shuttle between Anschutz and uh, the Denver campus is not up currently in operation. But you should also know as well that the RTD Echo Pass is available for staff and faculty at no charge through the end of the year. 
Uh, those are my talking points for this point, Ryan, if there's anything else. That's great. Thanks a lot, Greg. I appreciate that. I should note that uh, later in this conversation, uh, Rob Byers, who uh, works in facilities, is in charge of facilities for the AHEC campus, uh, will join us on the panel so he can speak to uh, what the Rary campus is, is doing. They have similar safety protocols. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Richard Allen. Uh, he's an associate dean with CLAS, and he's going to talk a little bit about teaching and learning, and I will post some uh, links in the chat as he speaks as well. Great, thank you. And um, thank you to everyone uh, on the on the uh, call today. And uh, I want to echo the appreciation for all of the work that folks are doing in the classroom to provide an outstanding education for our students under these very unusual times. Um, I'm going to talk about three things very briefly, course modes, pedagogy practices, and some resources that I hope will be helpful. I know some of this we've been talking about for a little while, but it's it's good for the reminder and to um, continue to get the word out to folks to know how the campus is working to support you um, as you as you um, teach our courses, uh, particularly in, in the classroom right now. So um, we were as a campus, I think very successful in uh, meeting that goal of having a return to campus. We have a robust set of in-person offerings or hybrid offerings that have some in-person component and we've been able to keep them there even through the uncertainty. Um, in terms of the number of seats that are out there, we haven't seen a decline in in-person seats from the start of the semester to now. Uh, that's any different than we've seen pre-COVID in terms of the percent. It's a fraction of a percent in terms of the seats that are available. So I think we, we've, we've done it. We've gotten a robust set of offerings out for our students in in-person and in other modes that support their learning and um, and I think that's that's good news for us as a campus. If you have questions still about the mode you've selected and some of the rules or policies around that, the course format guide that we've uh, created over the past year and a half is available to you. That link's in the chat. And I, I would recommend that any questions about those, just consult your chair, consult your team's office. Um, we're here to support you in that and thinking through what's possible in the mode that you've created. Um, but I think that guide is very clear about uh, the ways that you can organize your class given the mode that it's, it's currently offered in. Um, you know, when it comes to pedagogy practices, policies, uh, again, some of this is just uh, to, to review. But uh, one of the things we've learned, I think we've all learned over the last year and a half is that the situations that have um, supported students the best have been those situations where the classes are, their classes are predictable, that there's clear communication from us as faculty members to them about what's expected and that, um, and that we built some flexibility because we know we're, we're not done with this yet. We have folks dealing with folks on quarantine and all sorts of other issues that are adding to the normal disruption that we might have um, through the through the semester. So, um, you know, to the extent that you're building that into your classes, thank you. We know that's helping our students. And we also know that that's that's this more work for you to do that. And we recognize that and we appreciate the effort that you're you're putting in on that. There's a great guide for this on the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning about teaching in tumultuous times. I know many of us have seen that and read that already, but just a reminder that it's there. So we get questions also about in-person, what does in-person mean, about attendance policies, about mask policies. Again, um, the campus is here to support you. So uh, with attendance, with in-person classes, yes, in-person means in-person. And um, we need to figure out ways to help students make smart choices if they're dealing with um, health issues. And we also want that flexibility built in for us as faculty members teaching these courses. So um, in-person does mean in-person, um, but we do hope that you know, you're coming up with ways that you can support students who may need to miss for those kinds of reasons and that you build that sort of thing into the class for yourself. But we get questions about, do I have to live stream my class? Do I have to provide my class completely asynchronously available if I'm teaching an in-class, uh, an in-person course? The answer is no. And um, 
you know, we know many faculty have created those materials over the last year and a half as we had to rapidly pivot to remote and folks chose to offer courses in modes they maybe never did before. So to the extent that you have that kind of resource available um, and you have a way to make it available to your students, that's great. Um, but those decisions are yours. Our, our request and our, our goal as a campus is to be clear and predictable in the courses that we're offering and flexible so we can get through, um, hopefully, <laughs> what won't be too, too long um, of a disruption related to COVID. Uh, mask enforcement. Masks are not optional. So um, please, um, in the classroom, you have the support of the campus to enforce the mask policy. There's a document that we've provided in the chat, we've shared it before, on how that works. It's a violation of the student code of conduct for a student to not comply with the mask mandate. So, um, and there are clear, easy steps there for how to deal with it. I know it's an uncomfortable situation, saying there are clear, easy steps, you know, is only maybe partly comforting. But, um, but what I want you to know is that the institution is here to support that and, and we've got your back on that. So students who are not in compliance should be asked to wear their mask. If they refuse to do so, they should be asked to leave the room. And if it, if it gets to that and you find yourself in that situation, the policy allows for you to contact Auraria Police. Um, and, and they will come support you in that situation. So do know that that policy is there to support you. And, um, and again, that it's, that it's, it's not, op not optional. Um, and finally, there's gonna be a list of learning resources we'll pop in the chat here in a minute. These have been in development since we came into this, so many of them before, but since we came into this situation in spring 20, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, has remarkable resources. The Office of Informational Technology has remarkable resources to support you in thinking about teaching in these times and learning how to use the technology that's in the classroom um, to support your goals. So please do take advantage of them. Those range from workshops to one-on-one -on -one consultations. And I know that from the faculty I've spoken to have taken advantage of them from the things I've used that they have. Um, there's a tremendous amount of support that's there and just waiting for us to ask. So again, thank you so much for what you're doing in, in the classroom, regardless of what mode you're teaching right now. And um, yeah, we'll handle questions as they come in. Great, thank you very much, Rich. And I wanna thank the audience. Uh, you have put a lot of questions in the chat and we will be uh, getting to those here in a few minutes. I just have two more uh, speakers and then uh, we'll be happy to answer those. So please keep those coming. Uh, next to speak is uh, Doug Cassian. He's the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Employee Relations and Performance Management. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Thank you, you're welcome. It's good to see everybody and welcome back to the start of the new academic year. Uh, we're, uh, I'm gonna to touch briefly on uh, alternative work arrangements. Uh, we're glad to understand that those arrangements uh, are contributing to the continued uh, effective operations of the university. Um, so we're talking about things like remote work uh, arrangements compressed work week schedules consisting of uh, four 10 hour days per week or alternative daily schedules outside the university core business hours of eight to five. So people working uh, nine to six, seven to four, whatever. Um, we uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, understand that a lot of these have been arranged in the last year and a half on an ad hoc basis but um, uh, really need those now to be documented officially through the uh, process that uh, uh, is on our website uh, currently. Um, and uh, so uh, certainly looking forward to uh, answering questions about that. Great, and we will get to some of those uh, questions in just a moment. Thank you uh, very much, Doug. Um, and next is uh, Ted Geisler, the Assistant Director in uh, OIT. Thanks for joining us, Ted. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Uh, as Ryan said, my name is Ted Geisler. And today I'm excited to share an update about a recent change we made to enhance support for classroom technology at the Denver campus. So working with faculty on the Links Together Committee this summer, one thing we heard loud and clear was the need for classroom support in the evenings. And based on this feedback, 
we were able to secure some resources and make adjustments to our coverage model to keep a classroom support professional on campus until 630. So this is exciting news. And if you teach a five o'clock or a six o'clock class and you run into any issues or need help getting set up, give us a call. The number's posted on the classroom podium in the front of the classroom, and we'll get someone there to help you get up and running and ready to teach. So that said, I also wanna be clear and transparent that we were able to accomplish this change uh, with the addition of a temporary contract worker. Uh, that employee is currently working with us through the end of October. So as of today, these extended hours are being considered as a pilot program. Um, and I want everyone to know that we're working within OIT and senior leadership to evaluate whether this will become a permanent change based on demand and utilization. So we will keep you updated as things unfold. And that is my update. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you, Ted. Uh, so now we'd like to open it up to your questions um, and I'd like to ask all the panelists to, to turn on their cameras and we will uh, we will address those. I also want to introduce uh, two additional members of our panel. Uh, Joanne Brennan is a professor of photography and the interim associate VC for faculty affairs. And Rob Byers is the chief of operations for AHEC and can talk about uh, facilities. And perhaps, Rob, we can start with you. I know uh, Greg spoke about uh, it for the CU Denver buildings, some of the cleaning protocols and safety protocols we have. Are AHECs uh, pretty similar or can you, uh, can you please speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. First, uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate you having the opportunity to, to talk with you all. Yes, actually, we have extremely similar protocols. We're using the same standards, the same guidelines for HVAC units. Um, we're actually moving as of this October to quarterly uh, inspections in all AHEC buildings for the HVAC. Um, otherwise, we're following exactly the same protocols that uh, that Greg had mentioned before. Um, also, on the cleaning, we're doing much the same. We are we are really focusing, especially on those high touch areas. One of those uh, important things that where people are congregating in larger numbers, including classrooms, lounges, and uh, common areas that they will travel through. Um, so we are uh, experiencing a downturn in our custodial staff. So we may see um, a little bit less uh, frequency in some of the offices than we had previously, but um, we're still on top of it and we're still doing our best to make sure that we have a safe environment for everyone. Great, thank you, Rob. Uh, we'll just go to some some questions in the chat. Uh, these are from the same person, but they're they're related. Uh, first up, how many people are getting positive results with the testing um, that's going on at the university and, and other locations? And then, if you have a student who is tested positive, um, how do you know where the student got it, got it from? How does the university determine that origin? I'll jump in. So uh, currently, we have, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have four individuals who tested positive um, who have campus contact. So we do have a handful of other individuals who test positive through our testing process, but those are individuals who have not have been on campus. For example, they're individuals who uh, maybe are online, for example, or uh, haven't been on campus for two weeks and they get tested and they come back positive. And there's still just a handful of those. So we're not seeing a significant increase in the number of positivity. Um, and it's interesting, actually, if you look across statewide, our positivity is actually on the trend down, which is interesting. Um, and that's consistent in Denver as well. So I'm not, they're not totally sure what that means and I don't know either, but um, there is that. As far as in the classroom goes, um, we actually have a document that uh, I thought had been posted. It actually hasn't been posted yet, but we will get it posted later today that actually is, gives you specific directions about how we're running our contact tracing process and what to do if a student notifies you that they're positive in class and then exactly what our contact tracing team will do to let you know if, for example, you have a student in your class who is uh, positive, because we are doing that, um, you know, I'm, we're doing our best at doing all of that all of the time. I'll just tell you that our contact tracing team is constantly reaching out to faculty to say, hey, by the way, this is what's happened. This is who was there. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. 
So that is our absolute 100% goal. Can I promise that every single time it has happened? No, but um, that is our plan is to reach out to the faculty and make sure that you know what's going on um, as soon as we do. Our goal typically <clears throat> in classes is to identify people who were close contacts, right? The people who are around that individual and then do some uh, outreach to those folks through our contact tracing teams. Obviously at the beginning of the semester in big classes or in classes where people don't know each other, we can't we don't know, right, who those people are. And so in those circumstances, we have, and uh, I've seen these emails go out, have notified the entire class roster through email um, or other contacts of the potential exposure, right? So that's kind of how we're handling that at the moment. Um, you know, what we do ask is if a faculty member hears of somebody who has reported that they reported immediately to our contact tracing team and take their direction from the contact tracing team. Because it's gonna be our contact tracing team that we want to use to have those communications. Um, if a faculty member happens to know something, um, and, and I would typically say, don't typically share that without specific direction from our contact tracing team. I do know of a handful of situations where um, frankly, I know a faculty member who got a positive result back for that person right in the middle of their class and they had to stop their class. Um, so obviously that's a different circumstance, but what we do ask you to do is contact our contact tracing team. You'll, um, we can send you the link, it'll be up here. And if this other document that I just referenced, we will make sure is available by the end of the day um, so that you know exactly how it is the process we're using. Um, as far as whether we, how do we determine whether somebody's uh, uh, positive or not? What we've asked is people who are sick. If you think you may have it, we want to know about that. We want to think if you've been exposed and you think you're coming down with it, we want people to report that. So for example, what we will do is oftentimes as part of our form ask, do you suspect or do you have any ideas of potentially where you may have been exposed? Um, you know, the one that actually popped up a couple of times was a 24 hour Denny's of all things. Um, early on in this, you know, oftentimes people don't know. And so obviously we, we can't do anything about that, but sometimes people do. And so where it's possible, we will actually then follow up with potentially those individuals to say, Hey, are you positive? Is this something that's going on? Can we support you? That kind of situation. Um, we don't do that for people's families. Like if somebody says, Hey, I got it from a family dinner this weekend, we may ask, well, is anybody else from the university involved? Yeah, then we may get our contact tracers involved. But um, what we're most concerned about is those, those impacts within our community. Um, but the contact tracing team will also uh, provide resources. And that's our goal too, is to help students and staff and faculty with the resources that they need if they are gonna have to not be at work for a while. So um, that's where I tell you to continue to put your information and put that out there um, and, and continue to send in those self reports. Somebody also asked, or I'll jump into it real quick, what do I do if a student in my class is visibly sick? Um, that actually is a great question. We're actually putting up an FAQ on that too as well. And the answer is we view that, and I just confirmed this with the Dean of Students, as potentially disruptive. And as a faculty member, if somebody's visibly sick, you absolutely have the ability to say, you know what, you're excused. Um, and, and, and that person needs to be reported. Kelly Mason, who's terrific, and I know she's in the background, she can help put the links up. We do have links where somebody can just report a situation like that, and that'll be followed up on by our contact tracing team. I also got, I know Rob had a, a link in there as well, of people who say they're not, we see people who aren't wearing masks. The university also has a process that you can report, and Rob listed his email and somebody else as well, if they're contractors on the Auraria campus. So um, we do get those, just so you know, and we have responded to them and we have followed up with people and people have been gracious and appreciative. Um, uh, and if they're not, and they're not willing to wear a mask, they're not here anymore. So uh, we continue to have all those opportunities and hopefully we can get you those links. Um, and if you can't get them in the link right now, what we'll do is we have them on our website as well, the FAQ uh, COVID website. Thanks, Greg. And that uh, that URL is uh, ucdenver.edu backslash links together. Uh, we have many FAQs there. Uh, so let's go to some more questions. Uh, if someone on the on your floor uh, where you work uh, tests positive, um, is it only people who have come in direct contact with that person who are notified, or would you tell the entire department or entire floor? It depends on the circumstance. I mean, I think it really does. I mean, that's what I know my I know you're your lawyer, so I'll say that as well. But uh, it depends. And oftentimes, uh, if we're able to identify close contacts, we're going to do that. 
Um, the supervisor is notified. It's actually built into our system now that the supervisor will find out of that. Um, and typically, if, if we're able to narrow and identify it, then we would. On an entire floor, would it be typical that we would notify everybody on the floor? I don't know. It depends on the situation. It really depends on, is it an open environment? Were there meetings that week? You know, is there a common lunchroom that people use? Uh, I think all those things go into play about making that uh, notification. I will say this. Um, one of the things that we do, there are times when we perhaps may over disclose at times because we do want people to know. So I know people are worried that they're not going to find out, um, but please understand that there is a long conversation that goes on in the background amongst our contact tracing team and oftentimes me um, get involved in Kelly as well before if, if we do need to do a broader announcement and we do try and um, when we do need to do those. So thanks. Chris, you talked about uh, lunch rooms. Let's, let's stay on that topic. Obviously now the weather's nice, it's pretty easy to eat outside, but as they say in Game of Thrones, uh, winter is coming. So uh, what would you advise in a, a month or two if people need to eat lunch, uh, how they can go about uh, doing that safely? Well, in a month or two, who the hell knows? Um, I really, I don't know. I, I would say, you know, this is a topic we continue to look at is outdoor spaces. I know it's funny, but I just realized down here in Lawrence Street Center on the second floor, somebody, I don't know if it was you, Kelly, or who, but they put a bunch of picnic tables outside. Um, it's it's perfect for eating outside. I mean, I do think, uh, I will say this, the more you can spread out or eat at your desk or uh, maybe not at your desk, but in an office, um, I think that's that's the case. Or if you're comfortable putting your mask up and down, up and down, kind of like they do on the airlines, I think that's, that's gonna be the reality. Um, you know, we're gonna have to continue to look at, uh, do we have other big spaces that maybe we can repurpose? Um, so we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see Ryan, but that's, that's kind of where we are at the moment. Okay. Uh, another question in the chat. I know we, we don't have, uh, necessarily our, our medical experts here, but this is just a question about vaccine availability for children's ages, uh, two to 11. And I know we've seen various reports in the news. Maybe those will be available in the fall, maybe early winter. Um, but Chris, anything you can speak to of, of what you heard on the, on the national level on when those might be available to say ages, uh, two to 11. You know, Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, said it may not be until January, um, which is a bit nerve wracking to me. Um, I, I, you know, some of it has to do with the age ranges because Pfizer's doing a different age range than Moderna is on their trials right now. Um, but I do know they're gathering data, um, but I don't, and I know the data is going well, meaning they're using lower do doses in uh, kids. And so that's really the issue right now is not necessarily safety, but it's actually a dosing equation, which I get. Um, but I think it's still going to be a little while. I was hopeful sooner, but I actually think it's probably not going to be for a little while. Yeah. Uh, next one's an HR question, Doug, um, and that is uh, when when should we hear back from HR regarding our flex work schedules? Interesting question because uh, HR is not really involved in that approval process. That is a process initiated by the employee, and it goes to the uh, supervisor and to the department HR person. So I'm going to guess that there's a, an email somewhere stuck in somebody's inbox or, uh, or, or perhaps uh, they deleted it not understanding what it is. Um, so I would go back, I'd advise going back to their supervisor saying, hey, did you see my request? Um, and if the supervisor says, yes, I approved it, then I would go to the department HR and say, did you see that request? Um, uh, so I don't think it would be unusual that uh, it perhaps would have been missed. All right, Doug, let's let's stay with you. Uh, there's another lunch question. Lunch has been a, a popular topic today, and we're, we're and we're approaching lunchtime. Um, so this is uh, if employees are um, disturbed at work when they're say eating lunch at their desk and they have other work coming up. Uh, the person's question is here. Here is do we have the option to have a paid working 30 minute lunch? There's no obligation on the university's part to provide a paid working lunch break. Um, that said, uh, I think it's uh, uh, you know a, a good idea from a prudent management perspective. Um, so I would advise that uh, something be arranged to allow that employee to have that break. Um, Thank you. Uh, this might be for Doug or, or Chris here. Um, do staff members need to use sick time uh, to get tested? Uh, to get tested? That's a really good question. I think um, at this point, 
uh, we would encourage staff members to work with their supervisors on identifying good times to go do that as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I, I think we have tried to take it as a, as a, a an equitable approach or fair approach, which is we're not necessarily going to force you to get leave, but we also don't necessarily want to make it a two hour a day process. So I think that's kind of our approach at the moment. Doug, would you agree? Uh, that we're talking about you, uh, university required testing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think we would have to allow that. At, I agree. At work time. I agree. So and let me so, in. Yep, go ahead. Let me just finish that thought. Um, you know, we can we can also then require that it be done, you know, on the way to, on the way from work, so that we can, you know, maximize uh, an individual's uh, productivity uh, here at the university. All right, let me jump in real quick, Ryan. I'm going to ask Disability Resource Services. I know there's been a lot of questions about that, so let me just jump in real quick. So, as of the moment, um, there was there is a single mask accommodation. Every faculty member who that student was engaged with has been contacted. Um, there was uh, another circumstance where there might have been a mask accommodation, but the truth is, and this is part of what we're all learning together, is that it really wasn't that the person didn't have to wear a mask, but it was is that the person needs to be able to take their mask up and down or exit class for short breaks, okay? Those are all things that we can work with. The one circumstance that is a mask accommodation is one that I'm aware of and DRS is not, um, uh, uh, I'm supporting DRS through this and we're working together on it. And the plan is this, we contact the faculty members who are engaged and involved. And uh, one thing we also say is that uh, people who are unvaccinated are not eligible for an accommodation. It's actually in an FAQ that uh, we'll be putting up this week as well. Um, and the plan is that that person still be able to have 10 feet away from other students. So even if somebody is not wearing a mask, we still need to figure out the 10 foot radius. And part of the, what happened this week is if you can't get the 10 foot radius with somebody who has a mask accommodation, um, we change classrooms and that's an opportunity as well. We have some ability to move some things around. So what I would say is this, that our goal with the mask accommodation, albeit very, very rare, um, and I'll just tell you that, very rare. Um, the plan is they still have to meet the other expectations of staying distant from folks um, in a safe way. So I know that isn't necessarily, I know that people still create anxiety for folks, um, but the truth is, uh, you know, under the ADA, there are occasions, very limited, where uh, a mask accommodation can be appropriate, but they're going to be very limited and few, and we're going to put uh, requirements in place to make sure that everybody around that person is safe. And frankly, and if we're not able to do distancing, for example, um, then we're going to have to come up with another solution. So um, I know there's uh, some questions, too, about how do these students self-identify. I'll just tell you that's a billion-dollar question. I don't have an answer yet. Um, so uh, please uh, understand that DRS and I are working very closely together, and I and the contact tracing team as well, and employee, uh, employee health services are kind of trying to make sure we get touch, make touch and talk to the right people, including the students to help set them up for success. Because I don't know that we did have, have done that always the best way, but our goal is to try and set up the faculty um, who have to engage or engage with this, the students who are engaged with this to set them up for success. But like I say, I don't think you're gonna see very many of them. Um, uh, and if, if that does happen or that if there's something that changes, I absolutely, I personally will let you all know um, because I get and understand the concerns. I will say, and Kelly can confirm me on this, we have seen a few people, a number of people, we saw them last year who said they did have accommodations when in fact they don't. So um, I would also say, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or disability resources and services when and if that comes up, because uh, like I said, there's only gonna be very few of them. And we have seen folks who said they don't need to, and until we get it verified, then uh, then I think we need to treat them as they need, do need to wear a mask until we get it verified if there is um, uh, an opportunity like that. So thanks, Ryan. Sure. Uh, Chris, I know we've covered this in, in past uh, seminars, but uh, we have some questions on the legalities of if you can ask your employees if they've been vaccinated, if you can ask your students if they've been vaccinated. Can you just review uh, what is acceptable to do within the law? Yeah, that's a great question. So typically in most circumstances, we don't ask our students in a classroom, hey, has everybody been vaccinated or not, right? Like in the, in the course of business, that's generally not 
appropriate. Having said that, if there are specific classroom activities or small group activities or car rides or field trips that you're gonna be taking, then yeah, there may be a need to be able to, to ask some of those questions, but those are gonna be rare and few and far between. Typically from a supervisor to an employee circumstance, yeah, you're typically not gonna ask those questions, nor would it necessarily, you know, would the employee have to respond to you? The exception being exactly as I was saying before, if you have circumstances where there's a lot of close contact, for example, if, um, for example, I know, I'll uh, use an easy example, dental hygienist uh, who works in the dental school and the physician who's working next to, or the, the dentist who's working next to them and the patient. Does everybody know their vaccination status? status? Damn straight they do. So um, in that kind of circumstance, it makes a ton of sense in those types of situations. But in the course of business, generally not. What we have said is if you do have um, concerns and or questions, you're welcome to send them my direction. You're welcome to send them to Kelly Mason, who's on here as well, or Lacey Clint. And in those rare circumstances where we have needed to verify somebody's vaccine status, we can do that and communicate uh, that back as we need to. So if that does come up, you do have those circumstances, don't hesitate to reach out um, and we can help uh, get, get that information for you. And, they, and also make sure it's used appropriately. Because once you get the information, you have to use it appropriately. Just a, there's a vaccination question in the chat um, since they're man required by the university. Um, would the university give admin leave or any other kind of time off to go get those vaccinations and, and in the future for, for boosters? And uh, then a, I think I know the answer to this, but a question, if you got your shot months ago, can that be prorated for, for past vaccinations? Leave? You know, we don't currently plan on making an adjustment uh, because we have flexible sick leave. Um, and, and previously there was federal and state leave that actually could have been utilized for those purposes. So we're not gonna go backwards. Um, I think moving forwards, what we continue to encourage folks to do is um, use sick leave or figure out a way to work it out with your supervisor. Um, if there's an issue, sure, we'll figure out a way to encourage people to get their shots. So I don't, I don't know yet is what I would say. But if that's what it takes to get you your booster shot or get you the vaccination, we'll figure it out. All right. Another uh, timekeeping question for either Doug or Chris. Uh, is FMLA required for staff who submit sick leave for COVID that lasts longer than three consecutive days? Let me unmute here. Um, it really depends if that turns into a serious health condition or not. Some people have very mild symptoms. Other people obviously have tragic uh, uh, outcomes. So it's going to depend on uh, the severity. And that, that could also could be true for caring for a family member as well under FMLA, right? Yeah. Because don't Correct. forget that also. Could Parent, be child. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Uh, testing question. Do staff members need to be tested at one of the on-campus testing centers if they're notified of exposure from contact tracers? And I'll just mention in the chat, uh, just pasted in all the various locations that you can get tested to. They're not required to. Um, the only publics who are required to get go through our testing service are those who are unvaccinated and asked for an exemption. These, those folks we do need to keep, we are asking to keep us in the loop on. But if you're a contact, somebody says contact tracing, you don't have to go through our system. We do wanna make sure that you're getting supported, that you can get tested, that you get it quickly. I know somebody asked that question. I tried to answer that one, um, but you don't have to. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll ask to bring in uh, uh, Joanne or Rich or, or uh, Pam on this question. If a student uh, tests positive for COVID and they're taking an in-person in course, uh, can they request for the faculty member to have pre-recorded lectures or have the option to attend the course via Zoom? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. So there's, there's, no, there's no campus level policy that says in-person courses must have pre-recorded or Zoom options available to students. That is not a, a policy. Um, our practice, our, our intention is that we will work with students who find themselves in those situations so that they can um, continue to keep up with the class. So, um, so really that's gonna come down to the faculty member's decision about the best ways to support students in that situation. Um, if students are, students are, I'm glad students are requesting things, that means we're maybe being successful with 
one of those key principles um, with de delivering good courses, and that's clear and open communication. So um, if you have students reaching out asking for that kind of an accommodation, that's the opportunity to work with that student and determine, given your course, given what makes sense for the course, given their situation, um, what is the best way that, that you can support them as they make those smart choices about their health and keeping the campus community safe. Great, thank you. Uh, I know we covered before um, if there's a student in a classroom not wearing a mask, how to go through the, the, the protocols for that. Uh, but this particular question is more um, for, for staff members. Say in a building, you see someone in a hallway, maybe you don't know, and they're not wearing a mask. Should you approach that person, ask them, hey, can you please put on a mask? Is there um, some other protocol you should use? Could you address kind of the, the proper way to do that? I think we talked a little bit about this last week. I think our goal is to you know, and I, and I was listening to the radio again this morning, and do we all forget at times, like, do I step out of my office when I need to go to the bathroom sometimes and I don't have my mask on? Yeah, I do. So is that intentional? Hell no. But I think the more we can just remind each other, and maybe it's even as simple as, you know, pointing to the mask, frankly, that's a nonverbal. It actually works really well for the most part. Um, you know, that's what we are asking folks, right? Um, and, and we do want that to happen. We do have campus ambassadors who are on campus who, um, I did talk to Lacey yesterday who are actually uh, rounding on campus. They're spending a fair bit of time in commons, student commons, North classroom, especially the atrium, and then also the library to try and encourage and remind people. So uh, those folks are around on campus. You may not see them always, but they're out there. We're trying to make sure that they are out there as well. Um, but yeah, we are asking everybody in our camp, in our in, in, in circumstances to, to remind each other uh, because frankly, we are, we're doing a great job. We really, really, really are. And I, I, I don't want us to just think that, oh, well, there's all these mask lackeys out there because there aren't. Um, occasionally we do have people who don't and we need to respond to it. But uh, for the most part, you all are doing a great job. Uh, Doug, I think I'll send this one your way. Um, you know, some in the chat, some people have reported they hear their coworkers coughing or maybe they, they sound sick, but they're still coming into the office. Um, has the university updated any sick day policies or work from home policies that uh, say you're supposed to work in the office two days a week, but you're sick that week, you know, in general, I know it requires supervisor approval. Could you just work from home that, that whole week? I, yeah, I would encourage the supervisor to consider the uh, health and welfare of the colleagues there and, and perhaps uh, for this kind of a situation on an ad hoc basis, approve them working remotely if uh, the unit can withstand that. Um, if not, you know, going to have to be uh, sick leave. Okay. And then I think we're clear on what our mask policy is on campus. Obviously, it's, it's everywhere indoors unless you can maintain 10 feet of distance. Um, but what about the question in the chat? What about those who have to travel outside of campus, uh, say admissions, recruiting and such? Is there a protocol on um, wearing masks, say, if you're recruiting in a high school and that high school does not have a mask mandate? I would say our mask requirement applies to any circumstance where we're doing active uh, university business. And so that would mean the mask mandate follows you where you go do university business. Uh, regardless of the school you're in, right? Um, I We all also say if some place is more restrictive, you have to follow their restrictions, right? And I, you know, uh, student teaching is the one that I think of that we get a lot of questions on. Um, but yeah, no, the, the mask requirement follows you where you go. Next question, is there any consideration for those who are not able to get the vaccine due to um, exemptions that are approved by the state, such as religious uh, medical personal? Uh, and the way they're being perceived or treated by others. It seems, this is reading from a chat question, it seems to me that there is an attitude of vaccine shaming um, from even, uh, you know, those who, who don't get the, the vaccine. That's a hard question. Um, I think, uh, you know, we absolutely want to be supportive of uh, folks who are unvaccinated. Um, and part of the way I would say that is, you know, what we know about Delta right now is if you're unvaccinated, you're going to get sick. And I hate to say it that way, but that's what the statistics demonstrate. So part of the way that I want to help support those folks is to help remind them to be prepared for uh, potentially getting sick. And how can we help you do that? Uh, you know, from a sick leave standpoint, from a getting ready for your classes, all that kind of thing. Um, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Should we be 
uh, shaming folks who aren't able to or aren't comfortable getting it. No, I, I would agree with it. Um, we don't want to be doing that. And if somebody does uh, see that, please report that either to links together at ucdenver.edu um, or through the link that Kelly put up uh, earlier, because uh, you know we do want to respond to those things. And we and and just so you know, and I know I saw, I think I saw some parents maybe or some students in here as well asking how do I get my faculty member to respond. Um, please provide that info. Please use the links we have. Please use the forms. I know Pam, you're available for CLAS. I know Rich, you are too, myself as well. We get that stuff sometimes and we can help sometimes respond and help get things moving. So please let us know and we can absolutely try and jump in um, because I know they're overworked faculty and I'm sure they're wanting to get to things. And I know our links together inbox was a couple days behind. We were behind on them things. So please, uh, we do want to hear from you. So now we have just a few minutes left. I'll ask one last question from the chat. I know we, uh, this is great, all the questions you've asked. I know we have not mm -hmm. been able to get to all of them. Uh, if there's a question of yours we did not answer, please submit it to our email address, links together at ucdenver.edu. Um, the last question I'll ask is uh, one in the chat. For those who, uh, who have to do the routine testing, are they allowed to work on campus even if they don't have the results back yet? Say they're not showing any symptoms. Um, yes. Can address that one. Yes. Yes. Our, you know, and this this is uh, you're going to hear this from me too. If you're sick, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. I'll tell myself that. If I'm sick, I'm going to stay home. So that goes for everybody. But if you're getting the testing, our goal is to get you in the routine testing. We're not going to. We don't require you to stay away, right? To get clear. Um, our goal is to get you in, get people tested, and um, find out what we can, when we can, and get everybody, frankly, it's part of what I've started to do, which is get tested every week, you know, it's for my family. Um, so uh, anyway, thank you very much, Ryan. This has been a lot sure. of questions. In the, in the two minutes we have left, I thought I would just turn it over to uh, Pam and Chris, if you have any um, final words or any advice for our community. Pam, please. No, I just, I want to thank everybody for everything that they're doing, faculty and staff alike for our students. This is not an easy time. It is still anxiety provoking. And I think for some of us, it's more anxiety provoking because we thought we'd turned the corner earlier. So really hang in there, be flexible, and please reach out to us with any additional questions that you have that we haven't been able to answer. Thanks, Chris, anything else? All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for, for joining us. Uh, we do plan to make this video available in our Links Together newsletter and Links Together website. Give us a couple days. We'll have that up if any of your friends or colleagues uh, missed this. And we'll just encourage you to read our Thursday Links Together newsletters for all of our updates on our latest protocols and such. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.